Hey, how you going? Mark here, Intelligent Triathlon Training. Today I'm going to be talking to you about Lucy Hall, London 2012 Olympian and now 70.3 triathlete, and her recent visit here to do the inside physiological testing. So we're going to have a look through some of the data that she produced. Uh, we're going to have a look at how we can use that in her training, uh, how it will help to form up some of the key sessions that she'll do this winter, transform her from a short distance, standard distance racer into a much more efficient, uh, much more powerful biker for 70.3 riding. So without further ado, let's have a look at some of that data now. Okay, so here we go. I'm not going to go through all of the data that we have on there and uh, comment upon everything. This is just pulling out the key things that we found from Lucy's test and how we can use those and what we're going to do about improving them or controlling them. So on this page, we've got five key variables, five key factors, five key elements, if you like, uh, to somebody's profile. So we've got the VO2 max, which sets the upper ceiling of performance. And for Lucy's case, this population, this, this data on here is compared to a population norm. So for her, in her case, pro-women, uh, if you were a, an age group male, for instance, the, the way in which the scale would work. So you might still, you might compare yourself with a pro male and age group male. For an age group male, 60 mils per kilo might be high. For a pro male, it would be medium low. So, so the scaling on here is relevant to the population that, uh, that she competes with. So the 2 max, 67 mils per kilo, that's um, it's pretty good. So we would look to see, normally see ranges of something between 60 and 75 as being the absolute sort of upper limit for, for an endurance woman uh, and uh, pro level. Uh, we've got VLA max, which is the maximum lactate building rate, um, and a lot has a lot to do with the sort of glycolytic or anaerobic capacity of someone, you know, of a particular athlete. And although these things, the scale says top level or very low on here, the, the scaling is very much dependent upon the event that you want to do. So if you want to be an Ironman triathlete, uh, doing long distance or you're an ultra cyclist or something like that, you want to be very low. That's desirable. If you're a sprinter or if you're a criterium racer or a, a team relay athlete, for instance, triathlon, then you might want this VLA max to be much closer to what they classify as top level or, or a bit higher. Um, and the normal sort of ranges that we're seeing is all 0 0.2 through to about 1.1 um, in terms of uh, data I've seen anyway. Um, so 0 0.62 for a, for a standard distance, Olympic distance drafting style uh, triathlete then is, is pretty normal. So they need a bit of capacity to be able to push um, above threshold, high, holding high power outputs for short periods of time while they do turns on the front, accelerating out of corners, crossing gaps if they've not made the swim. So, so this is a fairly normal sort of figure for a uh, for that type of athlete. However, Lucy wants to move into 70.3 and non-drafting, which is much more controlled. Um, there's a lot less surging going on. We don't want the reliance on glycolytic power uh, and the sort of the anaerobic capacity to be able to to create uh, create power output. We want the aerobic system to be a far more dominant. Here we have the anaerobic threshold, so we've got 4.3 watts per kilo, 278 watts, and 80% VO2 max. That's all pretty normal, to be fair. Uh, it's, it, it correlates well with what we've seen her be able to produce in uh, standard distance triathlons when she's had to make a breakaway or have been in a small group, uh, still seeing figures somewhere between 260 and 270 watts, uh, and that you're not really going to maintain 100% of, uh, of threshold for, for the whole hour, especially not in a triathlon. So. Um, so that's sort of comparable with that. Um, and here we have fat max. So fat max is, there's a couple of different things within fat max. So first of all, we have the power that fat max occurs at, which is 183 watts. And then we have the rate uh, that you're able to burn fat at the highest, uh, at the highest level. So we want to use as much in an endurance sport, we want to use fat as a fuel as much as possible because there's essentially, even in the leanest athletes, there's essentially an unlimited amount of fat available. And if we can use fat as our fuel source, then we can spare the, the, the limited amount of carbohydrate that we're able to, to either store or take in. Uh, and this, uh, on the scale, is medium to low, and, and it is true. I mean, we would be, if, with an athlete with a, an FTP or a threshold of around 278 watts, I'd be wanting to see Fat Max somewhere much closer to well over 200 watts, uh, and that's certainly something that we'll be working on. So here we have Carb Max, which is 3.2 watts per kilo. Carb Max is the rate, or the, sorry, is the power output that you burn 90 grams of carbohydrates per hour at. And the reason they choose 90 is because that's the upper limit of human absorption of carbohydrate. 
Um, and 3.2 watts per kilo is relatively low. We would want to see that again moving towards uh, the higher end. So let's have a little bit of a look at some other graphs. And I want to particularly focus on this fat max and um, carbohydrate combustion uh, or consumption, utilization. Basically, it's the, it's the rate that you use carbohydrates or fat if it's fat combustion to provide energy to, to propel you forwards. So zooming in on this particular graph here, then we can see uh, so a green line, which is your fat or her fat utilization. As we can see, as power output goes up, fat utilization goes up to meet the extra energy around of higher watts. We hit an apex or a, a fat max area where that, that's this is the highest rate, and it occurs around that 182 watts. And then after that, fats are starting to produce uh, provide less and less of the energy in um, creating the the power output or delivering the power output. And the orange carbohydrate line is starting to increase dramatically the amount of contribution it's putting in. At the point when they cross over, we've sort of gone to 50 50. Um, now we're producing, uh, as you can see from the bottom's figures here, then we're producing 50% of our, or Lucy's energy via fats, and 50% by the combustion of carbohydrates. As the exercise intensity continues on, fats drop away completely, carbohydrates go up. By the time we hit second threshold, F um, FTP or anaerobic threshold, we are burning exclusively carbohydrates at a fairly significant rate, 240 grams an hour. The green line here is basically the range of fat max. So as you can see from the curve here, there's not a lot of change between that. Uh, so there's a bit of a range. The orange uh, shaded area uh, signifies the sort of normal uh, consumption of carbohydrates. So 60 to 90 grams an hour. And that carb max figure would correspond to this point here where carbohydrate combustion has gone over 90 grams per hour um, and we have a power output 208 watts. Uh, ideally we would like that to be a lot further over to the right as would we like this point here to be a little bit further over here. Uh, and so obviously we can now set training to be able to, to do that properly. With this information we can also work out how much carbohydrate Lucy needs to take on during the course of a triathlon. With Bahrain 70.3 coming up in a couple of weeks, we know the sort of target power outputs that we're aiming for. It's a fairly flat course, so it's fairly straightforward in that sense. And if we look at sort of target powers, then we're looking at around 120 to 130 grams of carbs an hour. If she's combusting 140 grams and consuming, i.e. ingesting, taking in for via gels or drinks, uh, 70 grams, so we've got a deficit of 70 grams per hour. Um, now on a two and a half hour bike you can do the maths and work out that we've sort of depleted quite a lot of the carbohydrate stores there. Uh, so bearing in mind there is still a run to come and she will have also consumed or combusted some carbohydrate during the course of the swim. She won't have consumed any, sorry. She'll have combusted it, burnt it, used it uh, during the course of the swim that we haven't factored in. 70 grams per hour is pretty much the minimum that she can be consuming and still get to the end of the race with carbohydrates available and able to provide energy. When we look back at some of her races during the summer, uh, soon after we just restarted working together again, then we could see partly due to fitness because she'd come off of an injury, but also partly because she was just getting used to this completely new fueling strategy that uh, she wasn't able to take on as much carbohydrate as she needed to and she was paying a huge cost for that in the second half of the run uh, as everything just went flat and she reverted back to her fat stores as being able to provide the energy and consequently pace, running pace comes down again. So knowing what we need to consume, it's an absolute no-brainer so that we can then make sure that she's completely on board with taking that, that strategy and then delivering and executing that on a day. So what does this all mean for her training? Well, if we come back to the first table over here, so these points here we were saying, this for me is the most significant point. In order to be able to have a higher anaerobic threshold, either VO2 max or VLA max needs to, to change. Now generally when VLA max comes down and VO2 max stays either stable or increases, then FTP anaerobic threshold will increase. If we were to increase this value and take this up to 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, we would see a drop off in anaerobic threshold because the anaerobic component is providing more and more energy of, to, to meet the demands of, of those higher power outputs. And ultimately that's going to lead to fatigue sooner or later. So in steady state athletes, such as 70.3 and Ironman, we want to see lower VLA maxes. And ideally I would be looking to try and get this down somewhere near around 0.4 
And the good news is it's very trainable. You just need to do the right kind of training. The training that she's been doing for Olympic distance uh, drafting racing has been fine. Um, so she's got a decent VO2 max, threshold's good, and uh, VLA max is fine. But with a transition through to, to more longer distance triathlon, more steady state, she will find a positive effect from reducing this down, having a positive effect upon her FTP. Now, the, good, the other good news about this is the type of training that we want to do to do this is also conducive to improving this. And just because this is here, we could see a much better uh, fat max here from an athlete. We don't just, these aren't necessarily linked. The good news for us is that the training for this will also help this. So, um, so that's, that's good. And that's what the next three or four months are going to look like for Lucy once we get past Bahrain is performing training sessions that predominantly work towards reducing VLA max. How do we do that? Well, to do that, we need to train in specific intensities. And it's it is quite it's quite uh, important that you get those right. Training in the wrong zones um, will lead to the wrong adaptations. So uh, so it is important. If we look at sort of base training, if we wanted to improve VO two max, we'd be spending a lot of time in this lower lower zone two, doing many many hours over a period of time, and we'd be working at sort of the higher uh, maximum aerobic powers here. Now we want to improve VLA max. And so what we want to avoid is exactly that on the first part. We want to avoid too much time in these very low intensities. We need to be using the glycolytic pathway a little bit more. So we need to be depleting carb carbohydrate stores. Um, and we need to have a contribution from the anaerobic capacity. But we don't want it to be um, switching on everything at a super rate. So it's absolutely flying away. What we want to be able to do is train in this sort of higher end zone here. So reasonably solid but not, re not really long rides. So for somebody like Lucy, we're looking at three, four hour rides, holding up a level two and avoiding like the plague, uh, anything in zone one or uh, long periods of time in zone one and lower zone two. The other thing that we could introduce into there is things like overgear work, where we're switching on fast twitch fibers by reducing the cadence down to 55, 60 RPM. Switching on the fast switch fibers, which will um, which will use glycogen as, as their fuel source, burn them out, um, and reduce that, and then um, start to train the body to use those fat stores as being more effective in terms of providing the energy for it. Other things that we'll be doing would be um, longer time trial type efforts in uh, in the medio zone, or something might call it sweet spot tempo. Um, that's sort of 80 to high 80 percentage uh, of FTP. Um, to spend with inside, we get much more specific information on what that is. The other thing that we need to factor in a little bit is some of the information we've got over here. So for each of these intensities, we've got an average carbohydrate and fat utilization on there. So if she is spending a lot of time in this mid to high uh, level two, zone two base training, then she can still expect to be burning 64 grams of carbs an hour, or let's play ballpark here, let's say 50 to 70 grams of carbs per hour. So she can't do these off of, off of water, um, or she could do one or two of them off water, but then fatigue will set in a lot earlier. So what we want to be doing is making sure that whilst we're not providing 70 or 80 grams of carbs an hour, we are providing some to enable her to be able to do the training um, and also improve on her recovery. So we need to be replacing probably about half of that um, per hour in order to be able to maintain that session. Not everybody's profile will, will be the same, everybody's profile will be different, um, certainly in, in certain characteristics. And your training needs to reflect those different characteristics. We had an example recently, we had a couple of guys come in for testing and it was quite curious because they were a perfect example really of how two people with the same FTP can have completely different profiles above and below that. Uh, they just happened to cross over at uh, around 280 watts in their case. Both were 75 kilos more or less, uh, both had FTPs with 280 watts, um, but one with a very, very low VLA max and one with a pretty high VLA max and, uh, and all the associated um, other areas that go with that. So giving those two guys the same program would uh, probably benefit one of them uh, if the program was any good, uh, but the other one would, would fail miserably on it. Um, and you know that's what we see a lot of time with um, coaching programs and training programs, which are set from generic guidelines, i.e. percentage of FTPs or you do this type of training at this type of the season. That isn't true. Um, so in Lucy's case, we're doing a specific type of training because we want a specific adaptation. Now is the right time to do that. 
when it comes round to, to the summertime, we'll be doing some more training, having retested, hopefully improved that VLA max so that we've got a better, better result there. Uh, but there'll be other areas that we want to target. And then we start to build in the race-specific training and the race-specific nutrition practice because that's an integral part of developing the plan as well. Uh, so the whole periodization things uh, can be evolved through the data that comes out of these tests. And that's what's really exciting, is being able to get the data and repeatedly test and m modify training programs. Sure, I'm going to have a big picture plan, I think I know where we're going, but if the test data throws up something we're not expecting or we don't, she doesn't adapt in the way we're expecting, then we're able to modify that and, uh, and evolve with it rather than just keep plugging away doing the wrong things. Hopefully you found that uh, useful and, and interesting. And if you've got any questions, then please put them in the comment section below and we can see, get back to you. And if there's anything you'd like to see, um, any other content around this sort of area, then please let us know and uh, we can put it together. See you in the next one. Bye.